This is episode number 213 with the legends of data visualization, Andy Kriebel and Eva Mare. Welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. My name is Kirill Eremenko, data science coach and lifestyle entrepreneur. And each week we bring you inspiring people and ideas to help you build your successful career in data science. Thanks for being here today and now let's make the complex simple. Welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Super excited to have you on the show here today. My name is Kirill Romenko, and today we've got two super special guests joining us for this episode, Andy Kriebel and Eva Murray. Both are amazing data scientists and both super, super proficient visualization experts. You've already probably heard about either or both of them. If you haven't yet, Andy Kriebel and Eva Murray host the makeovermonday.co Dot UK project which is super popular which has gone through the roof in the past couple of years and what they do there is they take random visualizations from the internet and they redo them every single week they do a new visualization and they redo it to make it look amazing you can get all the data sets all the past visualizations at makeovermonday.co.uk and in this episode Andy Kriebel and Eva Murray are announcing their brand new launch of their book which is called the makeover monday book you can go and pick it up at amazon and it is an amazing book it's got 300 visualizations in there we talk about all the different um, things that they talk about in the book we talk about the different chapters and also andy and eva will give you some very valuable tips right here in this episode so without further ado i bring to you andy kriebel and eva murray the visualization legends from makeover monday Welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast, ladies and gentlemen, to this super special episode where I have not one, but two guests, Andy Kriebel and Eva Mare, calling in from different parts of Europe into the show. How are you guys going today? Good. Great. Thanks. How are you? Awesome. So, Andy, you're in the UK. What is it, 6.30 for you right now? Uh, 6.39, yes. 6.39. It's early. And, uh, and dark. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's pretty dark, and I mentioned that you look like you're about to get on your bike again, as you do. In the I am, world. yeah. All yeah. right, gotcha. And Eva, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Nuremberg. It's daylight, but cold, so I'm glad that we're doing this before I have to go out, so it has a chance to warm up a bit more. Nice, and, and please, uh, dear listeners, uh, forgive our guests, because they haven't spoken much, as Eva correctly pointed out, <laughs> since the morning, so might need a bit of time to warm up. Anyway, guys, um, you're very excited to have you on the podcast. Uh, I've had uh, each one of you separately on the podcast, but now like it's like double trouble, both of you at the same time. Uh, you are amazing guests. And first of all, I wanted to congratulate you on your book that just uh, came out, the Makeover Monday book. Congratulations. How are you guys feeling about it? It's been uh, it's been overwhelming. I would I would say uh, thank you for your congratulations first of all, and thank you for uh, your your kind words on on the back of the book. Um, it's been uh, it's it's been quite overwhelming. Um, I was mentioning to you earlier the the weirdest thing for me was actually seeing a physical copy of the book, uh, but then you know we we get to the Tableau conference and that was. I guess kind of the official book launch, would you say, Eva? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and to see people that actually wanted to buy it and wanted to read it and wanted us to sign it was was a bit weird. <laughs> why, why was that weird, uh, Andy? You're like, you guys are um, some of the leading experts in the field. Uh, I don't know. It just, um, you know, why would somebody want to read what we write? <laughs> yeah, I think we see ourselves as, you know, we're just, we're just these normal people <laughs> and we happen to write a book and suddenly there's hundreds of people lining up to get us to sign it and take photos with us. And it's just kind of weird because... You know, we just typically we just sit behind our computer and we talk to people without actually seeing them or hearing them. So um, it's a bit strange to suddenly, you know, because before we signed the book, we also had our Makeover Monday Live event, and there were hundreds of people outside the door waiting to get in, and it's just weird. Wow, wow, that's that's really cool. And 
Um, yeah, I think I heard about that uh, at uh, the Tableau conference. Like you couldn't even fit everybody in the room who wanted to come inside. Was that right? Yeah. Wow, that's that's yeah, insane. There were about seven hundred and seven hundred and twenty-five people, something like that. And how many could you fit in? Uh, that was the limit. Yeah. That was the limit, and so you had more yeah. waiting outside. Wow. That, yeah. that is really, really cool. It's a testament to the community you've built. Like you guys have built something incredible on Makeover Monday. That's the website, right? Makeovermonday.com. Right? .co.uk. Co. Co. That's right. So makeovermonday.co.uk. You guys, like, uh, for those who don't know the project, I'm sure there's probably plenty of people who know the project. For those who don't know, like Andy, do you mind giving us a short overview? What do you guys do there? Yeah, so um, the, the week starts, uh, even though it's called Makeover Monday, we, we publish a new data set every week um, along with a chart that, uh, that could use a makeover, um, hence Makeover Monday. Uh, now, we do publish the data on Sundays, but we do that primarily because a lot of companies don't allow their people time to learn, mm. um, unfortunately. So people uh, want to be able to participate, so we, we publish it on, on Sunday. But the bulk of the uh, of the the work comes on, on Monday and Tuesday, I would say. So um, we encourage people to just do something quick, um, time box it to an hour if you can, um, especially that's what we do during our Makeover Monday Live. Uh, and then it starts a discussion during the week. Um, even I run a weekly uh, webinar we call Viz Review where people can submit their work for us to review. And uh, so we do that for about an hour every week. And now we've also added in, um, what about, about a 10 minute, demo something like that at the end so we'll just take a fresh look at the data set and show how quickly you can build something mm -hmm. and then we write a weekly recap uh, we write a blog post that includes uh, maybe a couple of lessons um, one about design and one about analysis and then we uh, we choose our favorite visualizations from the week so uh, and then that becomes part of our gallery so we have a gallery on on the website that has what I say the other day 354 images just from 2018. Wow. So um, it's, it's really cool. Uh, but yeah, the, the general idea is you, you get a new data set each week that you're unfamiliar with and uh, try to make something better than the original. Gotcha. And people naturally have access to all the archives as well. So you can take any past data yep. set as well. That's yeah, awesome. it goes back to the beginning of, of 2016. So that's what a hundred and uh, I guess we're at 150 right now. This was, this was the 150th data set, Eva. So wow. you should write about that. <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome you guys are legends and uh, i'm just gonna ask you how much does access to this service cost is it like a hundred dollars five hundred dollars a week ten thousand dollars a year ten Which billion <laughs> uh, it's it's completely free so um yeah come so anyone who can participate and they can get the data for free uh, the data is public data anyway, so we just collate it in one place on data.world on our page. And the the website has all the resources, so makeovermonday.co.uk, where you can find the data sets, find the previous blog post, find the gallery that Andy mentioned, get some inspiration, and also order the book, of course. Mm. Uh, and then participation just happens kind of organically. So people participate, they post their results, so they post the submission, online, um, ideally on Twitter and data.world so that we have everything in one place, but on Twitter they can also join the conversation around it using the hashtag Makeover Monday and get feedback from other people, be become part of the community, but also have their work seen by others in the industry and beyond. Um, and that's what we notice why getting away from Twitter, which we tried earlier this year, just doesn't really happen because people still want to connect with others who might be in the industry but not participate or well, might not be in the industry, but be really curious. So we keep the conversation going there. And yeah, people just, it's, they, they have to drive it themselves. They get out of it what they put in and it is completely free. Amazing, amazing. Like all that work, 150 data sets, years of work, and it's completely free. What, what inspires you to keep going? Like every week you're putting so much effort into this, you know, 150 data sets, years of work. Like, what, what keeps you going and putting in all this effort every single week? Mostly it's people's feedback saying that it's helped them learn something, that they enjoy finding a new community, they've made new friends. Um, a lot of them have found new jobs. We have a list, list of 42 people that we actually know of mm. who told us that they found a new job, mainly in part of uh, 
yeah, because of Makeover Monday, because they build a portfolio of all these visualizations, all the work that they created, which helped them land a new job. And if just one person tells me, you know, this has been really fun or this has been helpful, um, it has taught me something, I've got inspiration, that's enough to keep going for another week. And um, no, it's, and it's not like it's a chore. We actually enjoy doing it. We enjoy putting the content out there, seeing what people create and helping them through it. Uh, and coming out with the lessons every week. But yes, sometimes it, because it is quite a lot of work, we, we do need a little bit back and that feedback really helps. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, that's very cool. Let's go back to the book. Andy, can you show us the book? And for, for, for those listening to us on audio, you can't really see it, but on the video version, Andy is showing us the book. Oh, there's a reflection. There we go. It's, it looks like it's backwards as well, but just uh, flip the screen and then you'll be able to read it right. No, no, I can see, I can see it right. I can see it right. Okay, okay. <laughs> awesome. Recover Monday, improving how we visualize and analyze data one chart at a time. And right. uh, yeah, it's so cool. It's a big book as well, right? Yeah, it's 400, uh, how many pages is it? Total? Include, I'm going to include the index. 472 wow. pages. That's awesome. Yeah. Can you show us a couple of just like flip through it so we can see a couple of visuals? Sure. Yeah, so let me uh, let me find a couple here. Oh, oh here's one. I think one of these is, uh, so that's that's a couple there. Um, let me find some, oh, here we go. Here's a good page. So this one here is four different pictures. So there's 300, there's 300 pictures exactly in the book. Yeah. So, but when we say 300, people think we're just kind of making it up. So we tell people there's like 301, something <laughs> like that to make it sound more precise. But nice. no, there's, there's ironically exactly 300 pictures in the book. That's um, so, it, so, it, you know, there, there's tons of things like, you know, so this one is like, you know, using maps appropriately and um, all different, all different kinds of stuff, uh, you know, looking at proportions. So here's mm -hmm. one looking at different proportions and stuff. So it kind of goes um, on and on with, uh, with the different types of, of visualizations. Um, so we write a lot about, um, uh, there's quite a few examples in there of, actual makeovers that people did, but that's actually, that's not the focus of the book. Um, the focus of the book isn't showing people's before and afters. It's the process and what we've learned through the process uh, of running the project. Wow. Wonderful. What, what um, uh, like I remember reading through your book even before like it got published. I think you, I had the honor to, to um, just see the initial ideas and thoughts. I was blown away by some of like the, how in depth you go into it. And I remember, really liking how you structure the book. Could you like walk us through mm -hmm. a little bit through the table of contents, like the main parts of the book, what are they dedicated to? Yeah, so we, we have um, uh, a couple of sections. The, the first, uh, really there's only, there's only two, two, there's only really only one main section of the book. Um, and it's, it starts with uh, the habits of a good data analyst. So mm -hmm. what are kind of, um, you know, looking at an analytical approach versus, you know, just building a visualization. Um, how do you add context to visualizations? How do you commute things clearly? Um, you know, working with data quality and data accuracy. So for example, this past week um, for Makeover Monday, I wrote about in the blog post that um, people need to sense check their numbers, um, make sure you account for the filters appropriately and things like that. So that's sort of some of the lessons in there. When do aggregates work? When do they not? Um, you know, keeping things simple, paying attention to detail, uh, knowing your audience, um, you know, iterating, uh, using color, chart types. And the chart type section is actually interesting because I, I, I didn't cover charts that are covered in other books. Mm. Um, I want to cover things that, um, that I haven't really seen written a whole lot about. Um, using text and then... What's uh, and then of the charts that you cover in the book? Um, so... Uh, something like, um, you know, packed bubble charts, tree maps, uh, slope graphs, connected scatter plots, um, circular histograms, radial bar charts. Wow. Um, and then we I also include a, a list of resources. <laughs> well, yeah. And, 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 you know, people, people use them, you know, every so often, but we wanted to write about, you know, when those work and when those don't. So in each of those, uh, for each of those charts, I'm just going to flip to the page right now. Um, we write about, uh, you know, we give a description or we start with the purpose of the chart, um, a description of uh, uh, a more in-depth description about it and when it should be used and when it shouldn't be used. And then um, we get into, yeah, and then there's um, a series of examples for each of those chart types. So, for example, um, when we look at diverging bar charts, mm -hmm. so you 
you can see there on the book. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you, versus, we've got an example of a diverging bar chart versus Trump, right? And then, so we get, and then this is another page of examples. So we're trying to give people lots of inspiration through the book as well, because they can look at, oh, okay, I see. And and all of the examples, we try to use something that's quite different, you know, so each of each of them are different from the other so that people can kind of maybe take bits and pieces from each one when they nice. want to. Uh, nice. nice. So it's, it's a source of, hopefully it's a source of inspiration for people as well. That's, that gotcha, gotcha. Um, so um, it's, it's like a book, not just with uh, visualizations, but also like with case studies, like real case studies of how, you know, like you can real, some, some people might relate to this one, some people might relate to that one. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd use the word uh, case studies because I think about business case studies in that example, but um, s some of them are, yeah, some of them are actual um, charts that, that people created and, and we show the makeover process. Uh, maybe it was there before and after. Um, so there's, there's a couple where we actually included the person's first visualization, the feedback that we gave them, particularly in the, in the chapter about iteration. Yeah. Um, we showed their before uh, what they the feedback that we gave them and then the after visualization so people can see, okay, these aren't really complicated changes, but it helps it communicate much more clearly. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and Eva, what would you say is your favorite part of the book? What is your favorite chapter? I know like you probably love all of them because it's your, your creation, but like, what would you say is like one of your favorite chapters that you maybe <laughs> wouldn't mind sharing a little bit with us on the podcast about? Yeah. So I would say my favorite section is the community section at the back. Mm. because that highlights different authors who've made the project what it is and who made strong contributions over the years and really helped us to grow the community because we do need people who are, you know, regular contributors who can help others and who can take some of the load of giving feedback from us because we're not the only ones who know something. So we rely on others to also provide feedback because also at some point we sleep. And on Twitter, you know, very much the conversation is reasonably real time. So if we don't respond for eight or 10 hours, oh, there's a picture, um, then yes. <laughs> oh, I should highlight, yes, um, Joe Redburn. So he's our youngest man. He's, I think, 10 years by now, um, but he joined when he was eight uh, in 2016 and visualizations. So um, yeah, we feature a lot of the authors in that chapter. And I really like that because the community is what it's all about. In terms of the technical chapters, I like the color chapter because I like colors. <laughs> and she wrote and it. And maybe because I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and because I had the honor of having a read study from Tableau. She's um, a very famous researcher in the field of Who color. Was it? She Maureen Stone okay. from Tableau. Uh, she reviewed it. So um, I think that's, that's why I have a very strong connection to that chapter. But also I like um, the chapters on, you know, text and annotations because I think they're such valuable lessons for people to take into building visualizations and trying to communicate information. I, I, Carol, I remember when, uh, when Eva was uh, considering sending that chapter to Maureen, she was like, oh my God, I am terrified to do this. This lady is a color expert in the world. And uh, is she going to, is she going to tear Is she going to tear it to shreds? You know, so uh, sorry really, guys, uh, I lost you there for a second. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, uh, um, uh, you were talking about the review from Tableau about the colors. Yeah. How you were yeah. attached to it. Okay, yeah. So um, I really like that chapter because I have a personal connection to it, and because I got to speak to Maureen Stone in Seattle. Actually, I was on a visit there in March, and I had 15 minutes with her. She gave me a really quick brain dump, which was great. And then I asked her whether she would review the chapter and she said, yes. So later on I sent it to her. Um, and it just feels really special because I think a lot of effort went into that. When you have someone who's a renowned researcher looking at your work, you make sure that it's as good as you possibly can have it before you, you know, send it through. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And Andy, you were nervous about somebody reviewing the book? Uh, well, no, I wasn't nervous. So Eva was nervous about sending it to Maureen because of her expertise in the field. And, and uh, she was a bit nervous that she would tear it to shreds and <laughs> she would have to start over because that was by far uh, Eva's longest chapter. So mm -hmm. um, I think we ended up paring that one down quite a bit and, and simplifying the chapter. Um, but it, it, it's, it's really amazing. It's, it's, you know, we, it, it's fascinating to have, or it's an honor to have people like Maureen spend their time reviewing some of the work for us.
That's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, so it all passed, you know, like if, if it passed my Marines review, then, you know, that, that means it probably is an amazing chapter and a lot of people can learn from that. Um, that's, that's really cool. I like that. Um, that, uh, that over, oh, um, can you share us, Eva, can you share with us a, like an insight about colors? Like I, that's your favorite chapter. What is like one key takeaway that our listeners can, that you can help them out right now to better apply in their work? Oh, red and green, red and green. So um, keeping that's in nice mind, color. Yeah, keeping in mind color impairments that people might have. And I actually have at least one colleague I know of who can't differentiate between red and green. So he sees shades of kind of blue and gray mm. and using red and green in combination in a single visualization. We, I could write about it every week for Makeup Monday because every week someone uses it. And uh, sometimes I say to Andy, I'm like, did nobody read last week's blog post? Um, because we talk about it so often. Um, I think it's not really a big issue if the colors are used in you know, very separate parts of the visualization or the dashboard. And it's very clear sort of what the meaning is and there's good labels. But if there's a bar chart that literally just has red and green bars, um, it just gets so difficult. So I think using something like a a colorblind checker, there's a number of different tools out there where you can upload your picture um, of your visualization and it shows you what it looks like for people with color impairment um, or, or vision, sorry, vision impairment for colors. That will be really helpful. And also just picking color palettes that are already taking that into consideration. Um, and at the very least, just not combining red and green in a single vis. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Very, very valuable tip. Uh, and what I like about Tableau is it has those uh, preset uh, palettes that uh, already take into account impairments, right? So that uh, you can use those. That's right. Yep. Awesome. All right, you, Andy, what's your favorite chapter and what's your like uh, key takeaway you can share with us? Oh, um, I, I think my favorite chapter is the one about context. Um, I, I preach about that a lot, especially in my teaching at the data school. Um, because, uh, you know, just putting something on the screen doesn't really add any value. You have to, you know, I encourage people to always say, okay, well, compared to what? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you put a, you know, a big ass number on, on your dashboard, it's just a big number. Um, you know, you might say you have 3.3 million users or you have 50 users. Both of those might be big numbers uh, for your company, but unless you add context to it, it it's, it, they're meaningless. So, you know, if you're doing big numbers, you should maybe put, uh, you know, maybe I like putting like a really small number next to it in text, like plus or minus prior period or something like that. Or if you're doing a bar chart, you know, why not have, um, you know, a target line or, you know, um, you, you have to have something that you're comparing it to, you know, you compare it to the previous period. Um, you know, any chart you create, you can add context to. So I encourage people to, uh, to do that. So, yeah, I would say that's my favorite chapter because I, I love context and visualizations. Awesome. Awesome. That, that's like um, an example that jumps to mind is like uh, a country could be reporting on how it's uh, reducing emissions of uh, CO2, for example. And yep. compared to its prior, prior year, it might be a good number. It might be like a significant reduction. But if you compare it to other countries in the region, it might be still very high, you know, depending on yep. how you present it, yep. different results. And what, what's like a, what's your favorite uh a case or example like from the book where you actually context makes a big difference. Yeah. Well, I'm going to need to actually uh, look because uh, I, I don't remember all the ones I wrote about to, to be honest with you. Uh, so I need and, to go to chapter 12. Go ahead, Eva. And while, and while Andy looks, I actually want to just reiterate his point. So he really does always use contextual information in his visualizations. And if you look at Andy's visits, he, you know, while a lot of us then might just report the actual numbers, he always finds a way to make them relatable, like, yeah, compared to prior period, compared to another country, compared to another product, whatever is in the data. Um, I always think, oh, he's done something good again. Um, <laughs> but he, does, he does make sure that there's contextual information. So if people don't fully understand what we mean by that or want to see some examples, just go to Andy's type of public profile and you'll see it. Nice. So, so here's one, Carol. Um, you can see, you can probably see uh, two lines, right, that are highlighted. Yeah. Um, but there's actually a bunch of other lines on there as well. Yeah, so, yeah, I can uh, see that's, that. that's where, you know, you, you're giving a couple of people a, a couple of bits of context there. One is you're highlighting, you, I, I think this is um, a particular um, month. 
I think each of these is a, is a month on here. I don't remember exactly, but um, you know, one of them is a month that you want to highlight. And the other one is maybe like the black line is all of the average of all the months. So you're comparing against the average and then all the other gray lines in the background are all the other ones combined mm-hmm. or not combined individually. So you're getting actually several pieces of context there and you could see, okay, how, how am I doing relative to, to everybody else? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So I, I, I love, I love using highlighting for, um, for context. Yeah, very, very powerful um, yeah. tip. And so it really is an art, right? Like these little things are what make uh, like a, a data scientist that might know all the techniques that they separate that a person like that from mm-hmm. a person who actually knows how to communicate, knows how to talk yeah. to the other, the other side, to the business decision makers. Um, yeah. How so here's a, here's another example for for like numbers. Hopefully you can see it on the screen. It's a bit t- tough to see, but in in that particular example, it's just four numbers, right? Yeah. But it has uh, two years, so it's compi- it's comparing 1979 to 2017, yep. and then it's comparing the month you select versus the the median for um, all of the months. Mm-hmm. And it's just to give you at a quick glance, you know, what's the difference? And then you know the ends of the lines have. Uh, you know, show the I have the end of the line labeled because it's the percent change since the beginning. So you're getting you know several several bits of context in one visualization to help you understand the the um, the chart a bit more. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, let's do one more each. I think this is really helpful. What what do you guys have? What else do you have? So we've got red and green from Eva. Don't use them together. And people with uh, visual impairment for color blindness and. We've got context from Andy. Uh, hit us with uh, one more each so that like, we can become experts at data visualization and communication. Eva, what do you have? <laughs> so I have to go off the top of my head. I don't have the book lying here. It's literally like, behind us all on the table. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but I'd say, I'd say um, storytelling. So story, using, using the layout, using the flow of the data, um, the way you structure your visualization. So whether it's a maybe top down or left to right flow, that you build a story around it. And not not every data set necessarily has a really impactful story, right? Sometimes it's just okay. I can I can just show you something, but I can't really <coughs> take the reader or the viewer, the audience on a journey. Um, but if we have something a bit more involved, and we saw a lot of those examples throughout the years of Makeover Monday, you can actually build a story. You can look at different aspects. Um, so combining charts with their titles, using labels, using annotations, and maybe even elements like arrows or lines to guide the reader through, um, you know, across the page or, or down the page to really understand how things build up. So some people start from a very high level and then go into the detail. Others maybe start with a detailed insight and then bring it into a summary at the bottom and a call to action. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really powerful. And we have a few examples in there um, that, yeah, really, really help just to show how can it be done and then people can apply that to their own work. So you're talking about telling a story within the visualization itself. Yeah. That's awesome because I think that's the next level. Uh, something that I often advocate is using your data science project to tell a story, right? Not just like delivering the insights, but actually, you know, when you're presenting or when you're writing, that, writing up that report, to tell a story of what, what the data is explaining. And uh, even, if it's, uh, even if it's not uh, just like telling the story of the data, it could even be the telling the story of how you got there. Like, I got this data set, then I talked to this person, and so on. Like making it engaging. But I think like what you're talking about is taking it to really to the next level where you have a visualization which conveys that story on its own. Of course, like if you're attached to it and you can talk about it, it's even better. But like thinking through the story part in visualization, that's really powerful. Th- thanks. That's a really cool tip. A tip. I think more people should do that. It's good, good that you have examples of that in the book. <laughs> All right, Andy, what do you have? Yeah, I, well, th- I think there's two that sort of go together. One is um, iterating. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the whole purpose of getting better at something, especially data visualization, is you have to continue to iterate on, on your work. Um, but it's also knowing when to stop. Uh, you know, you could... you. You, uh, visualization is never done. You just have to decide when it's good enough. Um, but iterating is a, is a large part of, of the Makeover Monday project. Um, you know, Eva and I send each other, you know, pictures of our work along the way and say, hey, what do you think of this? And, you know, we'll give each other feedback. So we're constantly iterating on our work. 
Mm-hmm. And then the other, um, the other section I really like is uh, the one where we're talking about simplicity. Um, so simplicity in design, simplicity in your text. Um, you know, ha- how do you use white space effectively? Um, you know, basically decluttering, reducing the text, reducing the number of charts. Um, trying to make the data more the focus of the visualization, not all of the words and all of the clutter. So um, simplicity is, is something we preach about quite often as well. Gotcha. Wow. You guys flooded me with, uh, or flooded us with uh, tips. So we got all the, we got color, red and green. We got context, visualization, <laughs> storytelling, iterating and knowing when to stop and yep. simplicity. That's all just in, in. Just in case people need to see it again, there's the book. Make over Monday. So I'm, I'm, like, I'm so excited for those watching video and guys, if you're, uh, if you're just listening to this in audio, then um, you know the book is really cool. It's black and white on the front, so you don't completely don't expect that there's all these. And it's a color book, right? You don't often yep. uh, get color books. That's really cool. Um, okay, so I've got a, I've got a like a question, uh, question, interesting question for you. So let's say I'm listening to this podcast and I'm sure there's lots of fans that are, of yours who are listening to a podcast and like, they're very excited. Can't wait to get their hands on. By the way, the book is already out. Can you guys, can people get on Amazon? Yes. Yes. You yes. Can get uh, on now there, there is a, uh, there is a bit of a delay getting them in the UK. I think they had some issues with uh, getting them shipped over, but those should be maybe this week. I think something like that. I thought they said November 14th. Is that right, Eva? That's the, I think that's so. the sticking in my head. Mm-hmm. Yes, but in the US, it's, it's out. So you just order and it gets to that. Okay, so Amazon's the best way to get it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So I'm sure there's people listening to this already ordering the book. But let's say I'm listening to this podcast and I'm really good at machine learning. And I'm, you know, like, I love it. I love programming. I love getting to that field. And I, I haven't really touched on visualization that much. And I really don't really think it's for me. You know, I, I, all I need to know is how to write, run a regression or maybe some kind of like k-means clustering or maybe a deep learning algorithm um, and i don't think i will ever need visualization in my career and therefore you know i'm not really interested in learning about it and these um, you know different types and techniques of visualization and how to use it better what would you say to people like that like who who, mm. think, who are you know confident that all data science is about is machine learning because that is a valid point of view and uh, they are professionals that get along without ever looking into visualization. How can visualization enhance somebody's career? Well, I'm, I mean, I, I would say, I, Eva, I'll let you go in a second. I have, a, I have an opinion about that. Everybody has to communicate their findings, mm. um, whether it's to your boss, to it's whatever. The simpler you can make that communication, the better. If you just throw a model out there and, uh, you know, one of the things we encourage people to do is show people that know nothing about your work. Um, and if they can understand it, then you've communicated it properly. That should be no, that's no different, whether it's data, whether it's writing a book, whether it's, you know, um, being an artist, whatever it is. Um, if somebody else can understand you, your work, then you've probably done something right. So, um, I, and I think visualizations are just so easy for people to understand, um, especially when they're done right, that I think you'd be kind of foolish to skip that part. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. That's, that's powerful, powerful advice, definitely. Everybody needs to communicate their findings in the end. Yeah. Uh, Eva, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I just want to add another example to that because that was <laughs> exactly what I was going to say. So when I was I knew a that, uni, that's I, why I went first. That's <laughs> 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 So... I studied psychology and I didn't have to do data visualization. Like, you know, data visualization wasn't my topic or data analysis. Well, data analysis was, but through the studies. So we had to do experiments. We had to communicate our findings. And even in a research paper, you have some charts that show how different, um, how different metrics are cor- um, correlated, etc. So you will at some point build a chart. Um, if you just focus on data science, let's say, and you know, you're not going to touch data visualization, but at some point you might lead a team or you might have to, like I said, communicate your findings with someone. Visuals always work best. And if you understand the basics of how they should be constructed, uh, that really helps. A book is not, it's not a tablet how-to book. It really is about best practices for data visualization and how you can tackle those and communicating information effectively. So I think it will be helpful for everyone um, and I mean, most people I think in business will at some point sit in a meeting where they look at a chart and they're like, 
what is this and what is it telling me? So we want to make sure that those moments become fewer and fewer and that more and more people sit there and say, that's really insightful, I get it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, very, very. I think you even made a good point there, um, especially uh, about the book. It's, it's a tool agnostic book. There's um, now a lot of the visualizations were created in Tableau because that's, you know, the largest par- number of participants are from Tableau. But the, what we write about has nothing to do with Tableau at all. It's, um, it should be a book that, that can last a long time because of what we wrote about. Um, you know, it it's, uh, has nothing to do with Tableau. That's awesome. That was actually going to be my next question, Andy. You're like you're like reading my mind, <laughs> and that is really cool. And I think um, a book like that has power. Like I'm, I'm really happy and lucky that you guys sent me a free copy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to that for a long time, uh, because the reason I think that the way is that um, these principles, right? Like our brains are not gonna change that that soon, right? Like maybe our the, the algorithms that we have access to and the ways we analyze data will change. And, you know, uh, you have to, like, if you have a book on, like, how to do a certain type of algorithm in um, Python or R, you, you will need to update that knowledge quite soon. But in terms of visualization, these are uh, principles that last a very long time. And uh, therefore, and especially if it's tool agnostic, that's really, very powerful for, um, for anybody to learn because then you can carry along, along that knowledge. Um, so on that note, I wanted to ask you guys, you mentioned that the book has like quite a lot of um, different areas of focus, lots of different chapters from colors to different types of charts to adding context and uh, all, pretty much the holistic approach to visualization. Um, and it's a big book, right? <laughs> it's it's uh, got a lot of pages there on visuals. Uh, it's probably a cool book to sit down and read and like uh, go through and uh, in your free time and just go through it. But how would you recommend for somebody to use it who needs practical knowledge now they want to in, empower their career would you say read it from start to finish or is there certain ways you can like get the most out of the book um like bits and pieces here and there while you haven't read the whole thing yet so i'd say it's a good one to do a first you know run through just flicking through it mm-hmm. um, if there's a specific topic where you say you know i really want to learn about color by all means go ahead read the color chapter or context or iterating whatever it may be. Um, there is a table of contents or an index at the back, so you can, uh, you can use that. But also, maybe start with the pictures and see which ones you're drawn to and then read the surrounding information. Um, that really help. There are so many images in the, book, in the book, so that should help guide people where they're like, oh, this looks really good. I wonder what they wrote about this. I wonder what was good about this visualization. So um, I'd probably start with the picture personally. Nice. That's, that's a good tip. What about you, Andy? What would you say? Um, yeah, I mean, at the beginning of the book, we, you know, we, we stress that this isn't a book about data visualization basics, um, and we point to other resources for that. So this is kind of supplemental to all of that information, or it builds upon some of those, you know, founding principles from Stephen Few, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, y- I, th- I think people that are new probably should should read it uh, front to back. The order of the chapters is intentional, um, but then it becomes a reference guide, and hopefully people flip back to it when they you know they say, okay, well, I'm I'm not quite sure how to add uh, context to my visualization in in this particular case. All right, let me let me flip open the book to that chapter and skim through it again, and then maybe look at some of the visualizations in that chapter and see how people have have done it. Um, I think that's one of the beauty of all the pictures is we're for each chapter, we're giving so many different examples that are based on different data sets, yet they all communicate the same principles clearly. So it just goes to show you, you know, data is just data. Um, You can always present it well if you kind of pay attention to those sort of core principles. Wonderful, wonderful. And I really like how you guys built a community around Makeover Monday. How do you guys see this book supporting the community do you guys envision envisage that people will uh be like referencing the book to each other do you think it'll be helpful for the community as like a, a guideline a like a foundational stone of uh what what you guys are talking about in the makeover monday project definitely i think it will definitely be helpful but the the key thing I saw at the conference that really delighted me um, about our community is people taking the book and saying oh, wow, I'm in the book. Thank you so much for publishing my picture because now I'm in a book. So they were really excited and that was something they could share with each other. They would show each other, oh, this is where I am, you know, or or autograph each other's books 
on the pages of the images. So I think it gave them, it gives everyone like a collective object, something to hold in their hands that they're part of. We all have the visualizations online, people write blog posts and all of that, but this is something tangible in the book. You know, there's been hundreds of years of uh, the humans having books and they're such a cornerstone of education and passing on knowledge. So to have your name mentioned in the book, to have your work published in a book, I think gives people something to be proud of, but also a pride they can share with the others. And also probably encourages others to uh, share more so that they're in your next book. Yeah, exactly. The next book, Andy. When's the next book, Andy, coming out? Uh, I, I didn't, you, I'm sorry, you were breaking up there. When is the next? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, no idea. No idea. I need to do some more convincing before Andy will say yes to another book. Yeah. I was just I was just going to um, to mention uh, along those lines of what of what Eva was saying. I'm I'm going to actually look and see how many unique authors we have in the book, um, but I need to figure out how I can. Uh, here we go, unique name. So let me try this real quick. I'm I'm trying to use pivot tables in uh, in uh, in uh, here we go. Oh, forget it. I can't get it to work. I'm trying to get pivot tables in in Google Sheets, but I can't figure it out. Okay, forget it. Do you remember how many unique authors there are, Eva? I, I'd imagine it's around 150 to 200 because wow. some of the images of these 300 images are what we created, but 250 roughly visualizations are from the community. So wow. I'd say, yeah, probably 200 authors. That's really cool. So you not only uh, showcase like your styles and opinions like you people will get to see other people's styles and opinions from it's, it's mostly it's mostly the others and um, we just had to put visualizations in there where for what we were writing about for the lessons there wasn't the specific example in the community because maybe we hadn't had a data set where that really could have happened or we could showcase it well so um sometimes yeah we created charts as well gotcha gotcha yeah i mean um, and and i think one of the big things there is that the book isn't about us. It's about the community. So, um, you know, we, we need to make sure that community or we intentionally wanted to make sure that community was, was the focus of the book because without them, um, there would be no makeover money book. Makes sense. Okay. Well, um, on that note, thanks guys. It sounds like a very exciting book for anybody to pick up. Highly encourage people to add it to the arsenal of, uh, sources of knowledge for data science and visualization specifically. Uh, thanks so much for going through the trouble and writing the book. I, you know, like you guys should be really proud that, that you made it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Awesome. Well, um, on that note, I'll let you go and uh, um, hope to catch up soon. Stay, please keep being awesome. Please keep doing Makeover Monday. It's such a, such a great project helping out so many people in the world. We certainly will. We enjoy yeah. it. All right. Take care, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. So there you have it. Those were Andy Kriebel and Eva Murray. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And if you haven't gotten your copy of Makeover Monday, the book yet, then head on over to Amazon, click the link below and go and get your copy today. As you heard, it's an amazing book with lots and lots of content, amazing tips and hacks, 300 visualizations, this will, book will last you for at least a whole year, if not longer. And by the way, uh, we're getting to the end of 2018. If you haven't thought of a Christmas present for somebody special in your life, like your colleague, friend, maybe relative, or maybe even yourself, if you haven't gotten a Christmas present yet, then this might be the perfect opportunity to do that, skyrocket your skills, and have something just to sit down on the couch and browse through. I'm super excited to get my own copy and can't wait for you to get yours. Make sure to click the link below and I look forward to seeing you back here next time. Until then, happy analyzing. <laughs>